Hey, welcome back everyone. As you can see, I'm currently on the road yet again. I'm actually in Texas right now doing some reporting on the Mexico border. Um, some good updates for you hopefully soon on this. I'm going to be spending the whole week here. Uh, some big stories to go tonight, go into tonight as well. One of the big ones being that while in China, under the Chinese Communist Party, a lawyer, and keep in mind it was just from a lawyer at first, was claiming that the Chinese Communist Party could potentially put people to death, that the CCP could execute people if they violate COVID-19 policies. And all these Chinese state-run media began promoting this statement, suggesting they're endorsing it. Now, this is, of course, a big update if the Chinese media are endorsing the idea that the party, the Chinese Communist Party, could put people to death, could execute people, could kill people if they violate the CCP's guidelines on how to deal with this virus. There were some reports of that happening last year. It seems like they may actually go public with it this year. I'll be talking about that. Um, also, folks, another story related to all being here at the border right now. It turns out these cartels, these drug cartels, have actually been running operations inside the United States using, ironically, some states that have, well, you know, opened up, you could say, I guess, with these new lax laws on marijuana. But because of the lax laws on marijuana, it means they can now run these drug operations right here in the United States. And as part of this, they're using slave labor, uh, slave labor that's actually very difficult to prosecute. You have people being held as slaves, working on marijuana plantations in the United States on U.S. soil, and there's very little police can even do about it. I'll be talking about this tonight as well, folks. A lot of other stories. And that said, well, it's good to see you all here tonight. Thanks for being here. Yeah, hard memory. said EMP now. Yeah. Electromagnetic pulse, one of the Chinese Communist Party's main weapons. Mall Dog 1000, you said Chinese has one billion people. Yeah, they do have a lot of people there, right? A bit more than a billion, actually. <laughs> yeah, folks, good seeing you all here. All right, let's jump into the first story for the night. Then I want, then I want to go into some questions. So as always, if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll try to get to them on the halfway point. Uh, first, I want to start with what's happening in China with this new COVID-19 uh, suggested policy, we can call it for now. But again, we did see examples of this happening last year. Now, it says here, Chinese media promote Beijing lawyers saying COVID-19 laws could allow death penalty. It says the Delta variant has now spread to more than a dozen provinces in China, including Beijing. To enhance control of the Chinese people, the government is, prom is promoting a view that, th that threatens to use the death penalty on anyone who resists cooperating with the CCP's policies. On October 24th, the State Council of the, of the Chinese Communist Party reported that since October 17th, Delta variant outbreak cases have been detected in multiple locations and have rapidly expanded across the country. This was happening because numerous infected people, they say, have traveled across regions, including the sp uh, increasing the spread of the virus. The actual source of the spread is still under investigation. Now, it continues a bit further into the article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But basically, what's happening is the CCP is getting ready to hold the Olympics. And does anyone remember the 2008 Beijing Olympics? And why is China being allowed to hold them multiple times now? 2008 Beijing Olympics were called the Bloody Olympics because the Chinese Communist Party used the Olympics as an excuse to crack down on Tibetans, to crack down on other religious groups in the country. And we're seeing them doing the same thing now. The upcoming Olympics are a tool, a reason for the Chinese Communist Party to use to go and persecute people. And now they're threatening to kill people if they don't follow the CCP's orders in the virus using the narrative of the Olympics. Now it says here, continuing, on October 28th, the CCP's official media, CCTV, referenced an article in which an attorney was quoted as saying, quote, violating the epidemic prevention regulation constitutes a punishable crime that could warrant the death penalty. Now, now, I know a lot of countries, you might say, well, it's just a media article 
who cares what they say? It's different in China. CCTV is one of the official state-run mouthpieces of the Chinese Communist Party. Reporting in CCTV is very little different from the CCP making a statement itself. And so if the CCP's state-run media, the mouthpiece media, is making the claim that violating the epidemic prevention regulations constitutes a punishable crime that could warrant the death penalty, that's essentially an endorsement of this from the Chinese Communist Party itself. And that's how it's being taken as well. Now, the quoted attorney, Zhao Zong, works for Beijing's Zongwen Law Firm. He said that any person who knows or suspects they are contagious or has been in close contact with an infected person must lawfully comply with quarantine guidelines. Yeah, folks, if you believe you're infected, if you know you're infected, or if you've been in contact with someone who's infected, whether you know it or not, basically you have to, you have to quarantine. In other words, they're saying pretty much everybody's going to have to quarantine in some way to not, make their, to not put their lives at risk in China. And if they do not do that, if they do not quarantine, this lawyer is saying, the act of endangering public safety constitutes a punishable crime that could potentially warrant the death penalty. Now, folks, last year when the Chinese Communist Party was pioneering these types of programs, was pioneering economic lockdowns, was pioneering locking people in their homes, was pioneering mask mandates, the world was watching, was saying, wow, I'm glad that's not us. I'm glad we're not living under the Chinese Communist Party and having to have our people subjected to these types of abuses. Then what happened? The CCP told the World Health Organization, hey, it works for us. It could work for the whole world. And the World Health Organization lied to the whole world on behalf of the CCP. And the whole world, for the most part, adopted these policies in one way or the other. Now the CCP is suggesting that murder, it's murder essentially, endangering public safety. And if you disobey its laws, you could be killed. The CCP could put you to death, potentially, if they believe that you're violating its COVID-19 policies. Now, I think it's far-fetched to suggest this could be done in many countries outside of China, but at the same time, who knows? I think at the very least, we may start, we may start hearing some of these arguments here uh, in the United States or elsewhere. At the very least, suggesting that, for example, knowingly or unknowingly spreading the virus because you're ignoring uh, laws, you know, quarantine laws or whatever else, could constitute manslaughter or reckless endangerment, which is the new narrative the CCP is pushing. Of course, the penalty for that will differ country by country, this is what the CCP is pushing right now. All right, folks, I mentioned a few times uh, that we're still demonetized by YouTube, but luckily we do have sponsors. And tonight's episode is brought to you by American Hartford Gold. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, I'm not the only one who's noticed prices on things going up recently. With a government that's printing trillions of dollars and consumer prices getting higher, inflation is now a reality. So I'm happy to introduce tonight's sponsor to you, that's American Hartford Gold. They have some ideas on how to diversify a portion of your portfolio, and they say it's with gold and silver, and they can also help create a precious metals IRA and 401k for you, and to make it easy to do so as well. They're one of the highest rated firms in the country with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. If you call them right now, They'll give you up to $1,500 on free silver on your first order. The number for that is 877-260-2764, or you can text Joshua to 65532. And big thanks out to American Hartford Gold, uh, again, our tonight's sponsor. And folks, on that note too, if you're looking for an asset that's typically not impacted as deeply by inflation, uh, gold and silver tend to be more stable on that. Now, folks, there's a few interesting things happening right now. One is the mainstream media, the education system, the narratives being pushed to indoctrinate the military, the police, other branches of our government. They're using this idea, essentially, right? They're using this idea. Uh, they're using an idea that, for example, you know, the history of slavery in the United States is this 
abusive thing that should be condemned wholeheartedly, and that people who are not guilty of it directly should be punished for it. That all white people are evil because they have this history of slavery. Now, if you go into the real history of slavery, you can watch our last episode. We have Dr. Mary Graybore on. It's actually, the narrative is a lot different than that. But while these media are promoting this narrative, they're turning a blind eye to slavery that's happening right here in the United States. Now, this may not come as a surprise to some of you because, well, over in China right now, many of these same companies that are using this you know, sl slavery narrative are actually practicing slavery. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has slave camps, re-education through labor camps, and other things of the like, where people manufacturing shoes, garments, a lot of products are being held as slaves. They're using slave labor knowingly. But folks, again, I mentioned this is now happening here in the United States. And ironically, through some of the laws that many of these same organizations criticizing the average American have actually endorsed. Now, what I'm talking about is how the drug trade is allowing for this because the cartels are now using slave labor on American soil uh, for this. The plantations are back, folks. Now, it says here, cartels using narco slaves to grow illegal marijuana on industrial scale in Oregon. Industrial scale plantations growing marijuana in the United States, and the police can do almost nothing about it, even though it's illegal. Let's discuss this. Now, it says, I won't read the whole article because it's a bit long. But it says the problem began when criminal enterprises learned, that, and now basically the pretext of this is that in Oregon they made these different. Uh, sorry. In Oregon, they made these different laws, um, you know, legalizing marijuana to different degrees, and those laws, through legalizing it to different degree, to different degrees, allowed them to well open the doors to decriminalize it, which have allowed criminals to well carry out criminal enterprises without risk of being arrested. It says here a bit further into the story, the problems began when criminal enterprises learned that they could use a legal hemp farm operation as cover for an illegal marijuana grow. They say they're just growing hemp, they're growing marijuana. And that they could overwhelm law enforcement as well which has been defunded for decades in small rural towns. A few issues tying into this. Today, the Oregon Health Authority reports that nearly half of the registered hemp farms inspected in Oregon are illegally growing marijuana. They know, folks, one out of every two illegally growing marijuana, and that's just what is even known by the Oregon Health Authority. They say of that, another 25% of registered hemp farms will not allow state inspectors in at all. So maybe the number is even higher. They won't allow the state inspectors in. How do you have a business where you don't allow state inspectors in? Now it says growers can simply thumb their noses at law enforcement with no consequence. Once growers realized that, the rush was on. What happened, folks? This is, this is a quote right here from Josephine County Sheriff Dave Daniel telling the Epic Times, he said, drug traffickers flocked here from every state in the nation and nearly a dozen countries every state in the country and a dozen countries outside the united states all the drug traffickers went to oregon and they said one of the best defensive backs in the nfl bought a 40 acre bought a 40 acre property here and immediately put an illegal marijuana grow on it it says a growing operation can generate nearly a billion dollars each year and the sheriff estimates there are hundreds of illegal grows in this, in this county alone. And he said that's why the cartels are here, uh, meaning the drug cartels, many of which are Mexican drug cartels, but there are others as well. And he said some people will do anything for that kind of money, murder, rape, traffic human beings. Now, this is actually not limited to Oregon. Uh, the slave labor issue. I actually have sources in the police department. I've talked to other officers who've told me similar things. Uh, what you have essentially happening is that, okay, so for example, in California, one of the reasons avocados are priced so high, ironically, is because a lot of times the cartels or drug traffickers will go into the avocado fields where you need a lot of water for it. 
Uh, they'll redirect water from the hoses to water plants and they'll make them water their marijuana fields. They redirect water. Typically the way that they end up finding out, right? Typically the way they find out that an illegal operation is taking place is just because they notice the water bills are higher. You have the same thing happening in California as well, indoor grows. And what's been happening is this, actually uh, what I've been told by officers is actually being done by Chinese mafia organizations. Uh, which is a, is a shift actually typically they would before work with through the cartels and not get their hands dirty so to speak by getting involved in the things on the ground i've been you've been seeing this as well with chinese grows actually using slave labor as well and the way they do it is this they're going to affluent neighborhoods uh, keep in mind the chinese communist party well chinese gangs do all the money laundering for the drug cartels all the money or most of the money laundering a large percentage of it uh, some of that goes into real estate, some of it's done through restaurants, some of it's done through illegal gambling, they have all kinds of ways. Individuals buying huge tracts of land, huge properties using straight cash. A lot of that is the money laundering operations for the drug cartels. The CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, supplies both the money laundering operations, the synthetic chemicals for the precursors, and the synthetic drugs themselves. But you've seen them get involved in the actual grow houses as well. What they'll do is they'll use these properties I just talked about. They'll set up indoor grows. They'll have beds stacked to the ceiling, like, you know, slave camp type beds, stacked all the way to the ceiling, bunk beds. And you'll have people working in these. Now, the ironic thing with it is even though it's an illegal drug operation, even though it's slave labor, the police can't do anything about it. You know what they prosecute them on? If it's done on, for example, these avocado fields or elsewhere where people are, you know, redirecting water, they can only charge them for stealing water. Not, not on the drug charges. They charge them for stealing water. And one of the ways they find these grow houses that are using slave labor in the United States, uh, I know of cases in California, for example, doing this. You know how they find out about it? It's because the electric companies will notice there's huge spikes in electricity usage because they use grow lights and things like that. And they will alert the police department, hey, there's a huge spike in electricity usage, like way beyond normal. Check it out. All they can do is charge them for stealing electricity, not for slave labor, not for growing illegal drugs in the United States, not for any of that. They charge them for stealing electricity. And so what you have folks happening right now, California, now Oregon, these illegal drug operations is a legalized narco organization, drug, drug trafficking organization operating in the United States, totally pretty much immune to any serious criminal prosecution using slaves, using people being held against their will as slaves. And I've talked to officers before going on to these, some of these properties. They'll find dead bodies. They'll find all kinds of stuff. And, of course, that would be illegal as well. But, again, folks, this is, this is happening in the U.S., and there's very little police can do about it. Uh, the current state of things, unfortunately. Now, again, real quick, if you do have questions, leave them in the chat. Around the halfway point, we'll get to the questions. Let's go another story, though, first. All right, folks. Been talking about this for a while. New York City had this health, had this worker crisis of, well, city employees, firefighters, police, paramedics, people taking out the trash each night. And I mentioned before that they had about 26,000, it went down quite a bit, of uh, workers who were decided, sorry, 22,000, I believe, who decided to not get the vaccine. And essentially the deadline was last Friday. Monday was the day where they were going to lose their jobs if they decided to not get vaccinated. And one of the big questions for New York was, well, how many people are we going to lose? How many fire departments are going to close? Remember, they, they closed over two dozen fire departments. How many police are going to be out of work in, a, in, a, in an area that already is lacking in police? How many sanitation workers are not going to work? Remember that de Blasio, the mayor of New York, was talking about, for example, um, because they're losing sanitation workers, people take up the trash each night, 
they were talking about taking the remaining people and extending their work hours from eight hours a day to 12 hours a day and also making them work six days a week instead of five. That was the solution. Well, folks, Monday has come and gone and the smoke has cleared and now we see the effects of this mandate. And it says here that 9,000 New York City workers, including firefighters and officers, are now on unpaid leave over the mandate, according to de Blasio. And it could be higher. We'll see. Now, not as bad as they initially intent and, and, and initially, sorry, not as bad as they initially anticipated it to be. But this has other implications, which I'll explain to you in just a sec. It says here about 9,000 New York City workers, including firefighters and police officers, were placed on unpaid leave Monday for not complying with Mayor Bill de Blasio's COVID-19 vaccine mandate. And he said this, this is his office. This is uh, Mike uh, Mitch Schwartz, a spokesperson for de Blasio's office. He said 9,000 people were placed on leave Monday without pay. Now, briefly on this, that's just the number they put on unpaid leave already. This does not mean that additional ones will not be put on unpaid leave. This could be just the beginning. Let's go into it. And he said they can be at work, right, if they change things around. He said the rest are in various stages of having their accommodation requests reviewed. They can be at work. And so, in other words, there are more in addition to that 9,000. In addition to that 9,000, there were others who are their cases are still being reviewed, essentially, and could also be losing their jobs soon or placed on unpaid leave, right? Now, it says data released by the mayor's office on Sunday night said that about 22,000 800 municipal workers are not vaccinated. As of Sunday night, that is the number, folks. Of those 22,800, 9,000 have already been put on unpaid leave, meaning it's not a whole lot better than we were technically on Friday. It's changing a bit, right? Now it says this. Around the same time, de Blasio wrote on Twitter that more than half of the workers who've, who haven't been vaccinated yet have submitted exemption requests, and those requests are being processed. In other words, again, you had 22,800, 9,000 didn't have any exemption. The remaining ones, well, what, 12, sorry, uh, 1,300 people over that, uh, 1,300, uh, 1,300, 800. Uh, they are currently being processed. In other words, these people have applied for some kind of exemption, whether it be medical exemption or religious exemption. We'll see now whether the city recognizes their exemptions or whether they're placed on leave as well. Now, a day earlier, de Blasio, a Democrat, confirmed that 91% of city workers got the vaccine as of Saturday night, which had been a, a jump of 8% the previous day. And so essentially what happened is, is as predicted, Essentially, this is the story. As predicted, the people who did not want to get vaccinated as of the 11th hour, most of them decided to not get vaccinated. Many people were fired. And call it what you want. Call it unpaid leave. You're, work, you're out of work and you're not getting paid for it. You're essentially fired. Unless they can find a way to get you know some kind of waiver to that and they can get unemployment or something like that or some other form placed on unpaid leave. And so what this means now is that, well, we've had uh, fire stations closing in New York. We've had, uh, again, sanitation workers understaffed. There's gonna be additional pressure on the system. The big question now is gonna be, will de Blasio recognize these, um, well, recognize the exemptions first off, will he be able to fill these additional slots and what will the lawsuits be? Um, again, I mentioned de Blasio is kind of playing chicken with, with the city of New York, with the safety of New York and with the sanitation of New York. Those who remember some of the stories from the 90s might remember similar things to this when you had the uh, union strikes. And you might remember that, uh, for example, the sanitation department went on strike, police went on strike. They called it Fear City. And they were doing all these promotions, the union saying, you know, this is Fear City now. You don't, you know, be careful going out at night. The police cannot protect you. This is Fear City. The sanitation department said we're going on strike and they called it Stink City. Because people leaving trash bags out on the street, they called it Stink City. 
It seems that Fear City and Stink City may be coming back to New York if de Blasio doesn't fold or find another way around this. Now, he's claiming they can fill these additional slots that have been lost. We'll see. One of the big questions, though, is will other states now adopt this? A big question for that is going to be on the elections. Now, right now, as we speak, the mayor, the mayoral elections are now taking place. De Blasio is going to be out of office, and very soon we're going to find out who the new mayor is. If a Republican wins, this could be a shot over the bow to Democrats. Uh, for example, the guy who did the, uh, the Guardian Angels, Curtis Silva, is running as one of the candidates. If he were to win, for example, that could be a shot over the bow to Democrats because they could look and see, okay, this could happen to me. What did de Blasio do wrong? I don't want to do it. But if a Democrat stays in office, that will also be a shot over the bow, stating very clearly that you can do this to people. You can have mandates like this. You can force things on people. You can treat people the way de Blasio treated New Yorkers, and they will still vote for you. They will still get you back in. Even if they don't like the person, they'll stay with the party, essentially. And so this upcoming election is going to be decisive. The one taking place right now is going to be decisive, I believe, based on my analysis, on whether what is happening right now in New York stays in New York or, the, or whether it begins to spread across the country. It's happening in a few places, Chicago, parts of California as well. We'll see, folks. All right, we're going to go into questions in just a bit, but I want to talk one more story real quick. Uh, those of you curious as well, the drink tonight is coconut water because I'm on the road and I didn't have time to make uh, tea. <laughs> but hey, it's not so bad, right? Now, folks, one of the big contentious issues with, uh, ironically, the Democrats and the Biden administration has been this local law in Texas which makes it so that if a child inside a mother's womb has a heartbeat, that you can't kill the child. If they kill the child, they can have different ways of going after the people who are responsible, including, for example, the doctor who performed the abortion and the organizations tied to it. They've essentially opened them up to different forms of lawsuits. The Biden administration is now suggesting, telling the Supreme Court that this is unconstitutional claiming that the Supreme Court should deem this as unconstitutional. Funny note as well, and I know it's not a funny topic, but Bill de Blasio, the mayor who just did these vaccine mandates, actually had the goal to quote to state on Twitter, stated on Twitter that a person's medical decisions are between them and their doctor and that nobody else should intervene. Now he's talking specifically about a woman getting an abortion but this is the same guy who's saying that medical decisions should be dictated by the state, not by your doctor, uh, really playing up, you know, comp uh, competing narratives and making that statement. But this is where things are at. The same people who are saying my body, my choice, uh, you know, you, your medical decisions are you and your doctor. The state has no business in this are the same ones saying that you, the state should stay out of things like abortion and so on, which has been, again, the pet project of all of this. And the same people now using the opposite narrative, right, and saying that, no, you have to get vaccinated whether you like it or not, whether it violates your religion or not, whether it goes against your doctor's advice or not. And if you're a doctor and you say otherwise, you're deplatformed, you're criticized, maybe you're even out of work if they can fire you. These same people who say, my body, my choice, talk to your doctor, it's, it's between you and your doctor, are the same ones now saying the state is what dictates your medical decisions. Again, a real blow to this narrative they've been using for so long when it comes to abortion. But folks, let's go into this real quick before we go into questions. It says here, Texas heartbeat abortion law is unconstitutional. And that ruling is not from the Supreme Court, which would be the body normally allowed to do this, but instead the Biden administration telling the Supreme Court that it's unconstitutional. It says here, a Texas law banning abortions after six weeks of pregnancy that authorizes anyone to sue when an illegal abortion is performed violates decades-old Supreme Court precedents the Biden administration told the high court November 1st. And it's contested on whether it violates precedent. It says here, Texas designed the statute to, quote, thwart 
judicial review by offering bounties to the general public to carry out the state's enforcement function. U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogar told the justices, and she said, quote, and it structured those enforcement proceedings to be so burdensome and so th and to threaten such significant liability that they chill the exercise of the constitutional right altogether. These are the same people pushing for the opposite, again, with these vaccine mandates. Let's get into it. It says the Supreme Court actually heard two related cases the same day. The first was Whole, Whole Woman's Health versus Jackson, Court File 21 to, uh, 2463, a challenge to the Texas statute. And immediately after, it heard Texas, uh, United States versus Texas, Court File 21 588, in which the federal government seeks to prevent the state state court judges and clerks, other state officials and private parties from enforcing the statute. Typically folks, the federal government doesn't have that overreach constitutionally, they're claiming they do. The Texas Heartbeat Act, also known as SB8, crowdsources enforcement as opposed to authorizing government officials to prosecute violations. The law which took effect on September 1st permits any person to sue someone who performs or induces abortion or aids and abets an abortion, similar to the way any crime could be reported and so on. Uh, but this is, again, suing, not reporting a crime. As soon as cardiac activity can be detected in a fetus, which means a heartbeat, which is generally possible starting at about six weeks of pregnancy. It says private citizens may initiate civil suits seeking a minimum of $10,000 per abortion, money that some describe as a bounty. We'll see how it goes, folks. This is a huge issue for the Biden administration for some reason. Maybe it's because Dr. Anthony Fauci and the FDA were using aborted fetal tissues like severed baby heads in their research on humanized mice, which they were using to create chimeric viruses, which they were using in the Chinese Communist Party's uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. Maybe it's tied to that. Uh, maybe they want to make sure that they have enough severed baby heads to continue to do research on humanized mice in order to develop new viruses. And, you know, how are they going to develop new viruses if they can't make their humanized mice using aborted fetuses, including baby heads? You know, I mean, that's maybe what they're going at with this. We'll have to see. <laughs> and folks, remember as well that the story of how they were making profits off selling aborted fetal tissues, baby parts, Remember the narrative with this, where the people who, who made this first claim, they were attacked, they were sued, they were said to be spreading fake news, they were criticized by all the mainstream media, and guess what? What they were saying that whole time was actually true. This is in fact happening. There is a for-profit business uh, around this stuff. Uh, just real quick, uh, Jacob T. Smith, Severed Baby Heads. Yeah, I should clarify that. Story came out not too long ago, Judicial Watch got FOIA request documents from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And they said it was the most disturbing information they had ever received under a FOIA request. Because they were looking specifically into, well, how is the, how are these medical institutions creating humanized mice? Because documents detailing how they were developing uh, chimeric viruses and, you know, doing gain of function research were describing humanized mice where they had mice that had humanized lungs. How do they do that? The documents that came back, these FOIA documents that were received by Judicial Watch, and these are public documents. You can read them yourself. Uh, check out Judicial Watch's website. They have them. These documents were saying that they were using uh, aborted fetal tissues. Among those aborted fetal tissues were the heads of these aborted infants among them. And so, yeah, it sounds crazy, but you can read the documents yourselves. Tom Fitton of Judicial Watch said it was some of the most disturbing information he's ever come across. Ah, folks, that said, let's jump into some questions for the night. We're, on the, we're at the halfway point now. <sighs> Wild times we're in, I tell you. Uh, real quick, I have mentioned we are still demonetized on YouTube, but we have started our own platform. That's Epic TV. That's E-P-O-C-H-T-V.com forward slash crossroads. 
and we have a lot of exclusive content there. If you want to find out about that exclusive content, also check out our newsletter. You can find the link to that in the description below, where we also have our book club, uh, where we announce the events on it and so on. You might have seen the last episode we did with Dr. Mary Graybar, our special live Q&A. Had her on as a guest talking about last month's uh, book of the month, which was debunking the 1619 Project. November's book of the month is The American Story. That's by Tim Barton and David Barton. Uh, again, if you haven't watched that episode, be sure to check it out. I think you'll like it a lot. Uh, but folks, actually, we have a lot of exclusive content that's on Epic TV. I'll show you a quick trailer now of one of the interviews we just did on there. What we have seen over the last hundred years and then really into overdrive over the last five, ten years has been really the abandonment of the working class by journalists on the left. How is this undermining democracy? It's undermining democracy because a nation in which only the top 10% gets any media or any political attention is an oligarchy. It's not a democracy. And essentially, the left has participated in the deplatforming of the working class. We have lost respect for the kind of insight and intelligence that is developed outside of a meritocratic, highly educated rat race. And I think that is a huge threat to democracy. Right, folks, again, that's our exclusive interview. We do them regularly on Epic TV. That's epochtv.com forward slash crossroads. Be sure to check out the Epic TV channel. Link is in the description below. All right, folks, that's us jump into some questions. First one up for tonight is uh, Haro, Haro, <laughs> uh, sorry, Jared Re, uh, Riguez 0423. One one. Sorry, I don't get I don't get spaces in the name sometimes on the uh, notes. It says, "Sir, are you are there accurate numbers for how many service members will be forced out because of the mandate? Could this be intentional to weaken our ability to respond? Eleven thousand was the last Air Force number I heard resisting. We don't have official numbers yet. The deadlines for a lot of this they you know they differ branch to branch." And in a lot of the different branches, they're still looking to see whether they give uh, exemptions for, for example, uh, religion or medical exemption or not. It seems to be the case right now, the word on the streets, and this is just kind of a well, well documented rumor right now, well founded rumor, I should say. The rumor is right now that they're going to be denying religious exemption for military. That's what the rumors will see if they end up doing it. Uh, but if that does happen afterwards, we should be getting a solid number on how many service members are losing their positions, even facing, for example, dishonorable discharge if they choose to not get vaccinated. Um, I'm, I'm looking into this. I'm doing I'm doing some work on this uh, on the background. I'm, I'm one of the reasons I'm traveling right now, folks. We have some big stuff in the works. I, I'll, I'll tell you about it. Why not? Okay, I've been kind of not saying this publicly for a while, but I'm working on some big stuff. Some of it I don't want to announce yet. I think you'll be very happy once I do announce it. Uh, but I'm going to be working on some investigations again. And so uh, part of what I'm going to be doing is taking these interviews we've been working on, and instead of doing standalone interviews, turning that part of the show into more full-fledged investigations. Uh, right now, I'm working on a few different investigations. I can tell you about one of them, uh, which is looking into the vaccine mandates. And so hopefully I have information on it for you soon. Uh, as you can see, I'm actually on the road right now. This is for another investigation looking at human trafficking at the U.S.-Mexico border. And hopefully I'll have some good information for you on that as well. Also looking into Chinese Communist Party drug warfare related to the fentanyl crisis, which Hopefully, I can give you some information on that as well soon. Um, I'm going to be doing these hopefully more regularly. We'll see how they turn out, but that's one of the reasons why I'm traveling so much. And again, um, just on your question, we don't have full numbers yet, but I'm looking into it. And when we do have information, I'll be sure to get it to you. Another question here is from Green Eggs 1000 You said, is it possible that this mandate walkout is part of the plan? You know, I was thinking the same thing. It's hard to say. Um, 
yeah, it's hard to say. I can I can give my analysis. It's hard it's hard to say what people's intentions are. You know what I mean? There's two different sides to it. On one side, and I, I know people in the military I've talked to who believe this is the case, this is how they're viewing it, whether it's true or not. A lot of people in the military are viewing the vaccine mandates as an ideological purge. Now, remember that right after Trump left office and Biden you know, went into office, they surrounded the Capitol building in the White House with a large barbed wire fence and they brought in the National Guard and surrounded themselves with troops as they held their inauguration, right? That was, that was the Biden inauguration. While they were doing that, uh, while they were holding that inauguration, uh, the Biden administration was then claiming, or the, I don't know if he's in, in office just yet, but Biden was claiming that he wanted to make sure that all those National Guardsmen, uh, the people who are providing security for his Capitol building and for the White House, wanted to make sure that they were not ideologically against him, wanted to make sure those were not Trump supporters because this was put in context of the whole January 6th protest. And folks, if you haven't watched yet, check out Tucker Carlson's uh, short video on January 6th. I, I found it very interesting. And it reflects a lot of what I saw that day as well because I was reporting from morning till night that day. Remember that Biden was concerned about the ideology of the guardsmen who are present there. And that raised concern that the military was gonna be doing some kind of ideological purge, that they were gonna be looking, for example, at people's social media habits or something else. Remember, uh, remember very importantly, that any of, those off any of those guardsmen, any of those National Guards troops who were at the Capitol building or the White House would have already had to have had security clearance in order to be stationed there meaning that they were already being screened. They were already being screened for possible security issues, meaning that what the Biden administration wanted were screenings beyond the protocol of even someone who would need the screening necessary to be there, uh, security clearance of that level. And that raised concern, well, what more can they do? Maybe they're gonna look at people's social media accounts and see this or that. That was the concern. A lot of troops right now, people I've talked to directly are concerned right now that these vaccine mandates are the equivalent of an ideological purge. Because what it's doing is taking people who will violate their own beliefs, who will essentially do things that go against their inner values in order to keep their jobs. And remember, that's what the blase and, and the people who don't are going to leave. They're going to be kicked out. They're going to be fired. They're going to be dishonorably discharged. And that's that's not a far-fetched statement. Remember de Blasio himself, the mayor of New York, was saying that essentially when it comes down to it, money talks. He didn't know those weren't his exact words, but essentially we talked about this last episode, that at the end of the day, money is what matters most and people are not going to risk losing their money in order to you know stand by their religions or whatever other reason they have for not getting the vaccines. That is the idea. Uh, will people go along with the mandates? Will they support something they see as maybe, maybe even being unconstitutional? Or will they choose to be fired? Anybody who refuses to do something that is arguably unconstitutional, who refuses to do something that violates their principles or otherwise, is going to be fired. And so what you're seeing right now is a purge of that 10 to 20, maybe even more in some agencies or different military branches, that 10 to 20% of people who would not follow an order that violates their principles or violates their constitu the viol violates the constitution as they interpret it or does something along those lines. Those people are gone now from law enforcement and probably soon from military in some areas. That is one possibility that you're dealing with an ideological purge. Whether or not that is the intention, that is, uh, that is actually part of the effect, whether it was whether it's something they meant to do or did not mean to do, that is in fact part of what happened, right? Um, the other side you had with this is of course, well, what happens if you can't properly police communities? If you have walkouts, if you have police quitting in too large of numbers, uh, for example, like Chicago is facing right now, do they then get rid of the police and maybe create a new force? Do they create a federal force? What happens? Uh, this could allow, for example, the federal government to step in and say, hey, we need to step in. 
uh, communities are getting too chaotic. We need to find a way to make sure we can maintain social stability. This is about public safety. We need to keep people safe. Let's create, and this is hypothetical. This is purely analysis. But, you know, let's create like a federal police branch that can police neighborhoods. And that would get rid of a lot of the blockades you have with, for example, sheriffs who will refuse to enforce things based on their own interpretation of the Constitution, uh, which is part of the American system and way of doing things. Those are a couple possibilities. Again, this is analysis. Take it for what it's worth. Um, this is just analysis. Uh, next question here is from Justin30. You said, Josh, question, why is no one surprised that all the statues being ripped down around the country is all Democrats? I don't think I've seen many Republicans. They're erasing the past, so everyone thinks it's all racist Republicans. Yeah, it's, it's bizarre, too, and they're not just tearing down statues of, like, remember, it's, it started with Confederate soldiers and Confederate generals, and then move to like everything from Christopher Columbus to George Washington to Gandhi. These are people not looking to just get rid of a history they don't like. It's people look, looking to get rid of history itself because they believe that history and even the United States is somehow representative of a system that they disagree with. If you get into the Marxist worldview, I, I won't go into this too deeply because I talk about it quite a bit. But, you know, the Marxist worldview can be really summed up as the negation of the negation. And I know that sounds nebulous, right? But let me explain. Essentially, through the destruction of something, something new will replace it. This was a Hegelian dialectic theory predating Marxism. Hegelian dialectics were the leading metaphysical theory in Europe at the time of Marx. The idea that through the destruction of the egg, the chicken is born. Through the destruction of the seed, the plant is born. And so Marx took that and said, well, what if we destroy everything? What if we destroy all of society, all of tradition, all of culture, all of business, all of government? What happens then? Then you have the communist utopia, the new society, the evolved society born from the destruction of all things, from the negation of the negation. The idea that there's nothing under the sun that should not be criticized, and they criticized everything. Now, of course, that's kind of nonsense, because if you kill someone, they're not going to randomly you know, appear as a more highly evolved version of themselves. There are limits to that, and I'm sure they're aware of that. Uh, but the communist movement basically works on this. They believe in destroying that which previously existed. The same thing that's happening in America with the tearing down of statues is happening in parts of Latin America. I have Brazilian friends who said the same thing happened there. The same thing happened in the Soviet Union with the destruction of, the, of their traditional culture. The same thing happened in China under the Chinese Communist Party when the Chinese Communist Party launched its cultural revolution and said to destroy the four olds, old beliefs, old religions, old traditions, etc. Meaning destroy everything they had, replace it with something else. That is what they do. And so these Marxist organizations, these anarchist organizations working under a Marxist idea, uh, this, this is really what they're doing, whether they mean to or not, whether they're aware of it or not, they're following the same thing like clockwork. Now, go over one more question, I'll jump into some more stories. This is from Linda Manning, 092452. He said, question, do you know about the sanitation strike in 1968 that lasted for two months and according to new at the very time was very bad? Um, I might have my dates wrong on that. I, I was talking about the sanitation strike, I believe in the 90s. Maybe, maybe I had the date wrong on that and it was actually 68. Um, they might have done it a couple times, but yeah, you had, they said fear city, stink city. This was in New York where, again, you had union strikes taking place. And yeah, New York was allegedly a very dirty, smelly place because people were refusing. Uh, people were refusing to, again, clear out the trash from the streets and so on, right? All right, folks, that says let's jump into some stories, some more stories for the night because it's getting a bit late and I want to go over a few more. All right, you've had a few different shifts take place, different states, different results. New York right now, we're going to wait and see how many of these police officers and so on are able to get 
exemptions for the vaccine. That is what's currently being looked at. 9,000, again, currently on unpaid leave, 22,800 total, still facing that, depending on how their uh, applications are decided. But in Chicago, there's been a victory for the police, the ones who've been standing up against these policies. It says here, judge pauses Chicago vaccine mandate deadline for police. A judge has put a pause on that vaccine mandate meaning police can continue to operate, continue to do their jobs, continue to keep people safe. It says here, a judge on Monday paused a vaccination mandate for the, Chicago, for the Chicago Police Department pending the settlement of a lawsuit between the department and the Chicago Police Officers Union. Cook County Judge Raymond Mitchell granted a partial temporary restraining order requiring that the city cannot enforce the December 31st deadline for the CPD, the Chicago Police Department officers, to get vaccinated against COVID-19, but said that, quote, the reporting and testing obligations or testing twice a week under city policy still remains in effect. Now, it continues a bit further into the story stating this. It says Mitchell's decision centers on the lawsuit filed by the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police against the city last month in response to Mayor Lori Lightfoot's vaccine mandate, under which all employees, all the city employees, had to report their vaccination status through an online portal by October 15th and get fully vaccinated, they were saying, by December 31st, barring those who, were, barring those who obtained exemptions for medical or religious reasons. Chicago is not going to re recognize religious exemption or medical exemption. We'll see if New York does. A judge blocked the uh, blocked that deadline, the December 31st deadline, altogether. So they're kind of in limbo right now. Uh, again, we have two different examples, New York and Chicago. New York was able to move through with it. We're seeing whether they recognize religious exemptions and medical exemptions. Chicago is saying they will not recognize that, but a judge blocked it, put on pause. We'll see what happens. And to keep in mind, folks, you're watching people, you're watching different governors, you're watching different mayors, you're watching different leaders, testing the waters. Uh, what works in one area is very likely going to spread. If it works in one area, expected to see it in more areas. Now, speaking of which, let's talk about the Pentagon. Because, folks, I mentioned word on the street, a word that's been going around, it's a claim, of course. They're saying that the Pentagon is not going to be recognizing religious exemptions. We'll see whether this turns out to be true or not. That is one of the big claims going around. It's kind of a rumor at this time, you know, based on anonymous sources or whatever else. Uh, but it seems to be a credible rumor because right now the Pentagon is being questioned on this. It says here, Pentagon ordered to specify how it treats religious exemption requests to vaccine mandate. The Pentagon, the Defense Department, is now getting pressure to answer whether or not they are going to recognize people's religious exemptions and their process by which they make that determination. It says here, the Department of Defense has been ordered to outline in detail how service members can apply for religious exemptions to its COVID-19 vaccine mandate, as well as how officials decide whether to approve or deny such requests. Pentagon officials must explain in detail how troops can apply for a religious exemption, the procedure for resolving the request, the criteria by which applicants uh, applications are judged, and the procedure the people deciding on each request use to judge them. That's according to U.S. District Judge Stephen Maryday, a George H.W. Bush appointee. Uh, this is an October 29th order. The Pentagon must file the details by November 12th, uh, but under two weeks from now. In addition to that, military officials must give a precise statement of the number of requests in each branch for religious exemption from receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. The number of requests granted, denied, and pending the number of people in the armed forces who are unvaccinated and who have submitted 
no request for exemption, the number of people whose applications application is resolved and who have received some change in the terms and conditions of their service, including separation of any kind, and the categories of results that have occurred and how many of each kind of result has occurred according to Mary Day. Now, some of those details, including how many religious exemptions requests have been granted tonight, have not been made public. The military has rejected requests to disclose those figures. The order comes in a case brought against the military and other parts of the federal government. The class action lawsuit alleges that federal vaccine mandates violate multiple laws. So folks, again, you're asking for uh, one of you asked earlier about, again, how many military service members are going to be losing their positions? Where is it at with this? Uh, a court is now looking into the requests and looking into the details on this before the numbers come out, before things really happen. Um, a lot of this is right now still hanging in limbo. So we'll see what happens with it, and I will keep you updated on that. Now, another big update from this, and this is just in one part of the country, of course, but a federal judge has blocked, has blocked a hospital from putting unvaccinated workers on unpaid leave. So one of the big phenomena we're watching right now is that you're watching essentially judges on different sides of the political aisle decide to block mandates or allow for mandates. You're watching different officials, mayors, governors pass different types of laws and enforce different types of laws. You're watching U.S. government agencies like the Biden administration's different branches like uh, the Pentagon. You're watching them get under pressure for their policies when they affect the enti entire nation. This is all really a battleground, essentially, to determine where state rights end and where the federal government's rights begin. It's also a big question on what is the constitutional law? How can the Constitution be enforced? when it comes to the rights of states, the rights of individuals, the rights of government workers, the rights of US service members. All of this is in the process of being determined. Uh, we will see what the results of this process are, but right now we're witnessing the chaos as the process is carried out, essentially. Now, we'll see what happens if you go by the Constitution. The Constitution is actually pretty clear cut, folks. It's not that complicated. Um, a lot of these things could easily be determined as unconstitutional, but frankly, constitutional interpretation has become so complicated that they could use some, you know, mental gymnastics to say that it is constitutional, typically. typically. This is where things are at. We're not going to have a solid answer on things. Things are going to be very chaotic until a lot of this uh, really battleground is determined, until the smoke clears we're not going to have clear answers on it, but even then, expect different states to have different interpretations and different states to have varying forms of enforcement. And by the time that happens, we could really be well, at least, into the 2022 midterms, if not later. Um, again, if Republicans are able to retake both the House and the Senate, or even just the House, which they have a very, very strong chance at doing, it could really end a lot of these things before they even begin. It could really throw a big wrench into a lot of these programs. So we'll see what happens. Not to mention the wild card of Trump's new social, uh, his new social media, uh, which is a Truth Social, uh, Trump Media and Technology Group, launching a media organization and a Netflix-like platform, Video On Demand, and the effect of having essentially public debate and public scrutiny returned to this country, which has been turned off essentially for to a large extent through social media censorship, through big media censorship, and through other things. You know, you have a few guys fighting for it. You know, Epic Times were one of the guys kind of fighting for the truth. Uh, but in terms of major, huge businesses, there really aren't many. And even then, when it comes to social media platforms, our ability to communicate, our ability to discuss is actually quite limited. So that is the wild card, this Trump effect, uh, as it has been for a while. We'll see how that also impacts this entire system that we've been discussing, because things could change very quickly. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what happens. And folks, of course, I will keep you updated as things happen and as we get more information. 
All right, that said, it's getting late, so we'll end it here. But, folks, always a lot to talk about. Um, I mentioned I'm on the road right now. You might notice I'm, I don't have my normal bookshelf behind me. I'm actually in Texas. I'm at the U.S.-Mexico border doing some reporting here on the ground. I'll have something interesting to show you, hopefully very soon, based on what I find here. I'm looking into human trafficking. Folks, keep you updated on it. Um, again, I do these live Q&As every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So be sure to tune in our next episode this coming Thursday, 10.30 p.m. In the meantime, be sure to check out some of our programs over at Epic TV. I'll show you a trailer at the end of this video. You might not know, but Sam Sorbo, the wife of Kevin Sorbo, uh, Hercules, uh, she was also an actress in the show Hercules. She does a show with us as well, and it's called Schools Out. And it's a show for parents who want to homeschool their kids. So if you're a parent wanting to homeschool your children or you homeschool your children, check out the show with Sam Sorbo. It's exclusively on Epic TV. I'll show you a trailer at the end of this video. But folks, as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you. We learned to set our standards from the school. That is to say, we never really learn to set them at all. I would say that a system that relies almost entirely on testing for assessing proficiency or competency is faulty. They've enhanced some things at school with fancy new gadgets, but by and large, our student performance is worse and tests are less rigorous. The issue with testing is we are training the student to study for the test, just for the test. And the classroom devolves into the constant refrain of, will this be on the test? Set the standards and watch your children surpass them. Adjust upward and repeat.